My name is Ilya, and I want uh, to tell you a story. Our team, like I think any team in the world, have an intention to ship great products uh, faster and have fun eventually. And uh, recently we have a meeting uh, when we try to find all the bottlenecks that we have, like that are not allowing us to meet this intention. And we found that the main pain point for us was our backbone views, or Marinette views. So we had a technical decision to switch from backbone to React. And not because uh, of virtual DOM, because you know only lazy framework nowadays doesn't have any kind of virtual DOM, but uh, because of modularity, top-down data, data flow, and all other functional paradigms that React force you to think about. So we thought, okay, we need to move uh, views, and this is like really easy. You just need to override the render method and call React, and it will handle your DOM manipulations and everything. But what to do with data? Because we have like a lot of handcrafted backbone collections that we want to, do not want to throw away and like to re-implement. So we wanted to keep, keep using them. We went to internets to try to find what's the current state of art of syncing uh, React components with backbone and found this. So this is like a mixing that uh, calls that listens to any events on your collection and forces React to re-render. But this is a lot of boilerplate, too hard to make the data flat because you need to work with backbone models inside your React components and this is pain. And also just think about changes detection. Uh, it's, React will do a lot of like renders without any DOM changes and this is not efficient. So we thought, okay, if we step away and we will think about what we can, what we will use if we don't have any legacy, what we will use like if we are going to re-implement everything from scratch. And we found Redux. Redux is a fairly new state manager for your application. This is keeps the state out of your app in like totally different tree. And this tree is immutable. And the only way to change this tree is to call reducers on them, and which are PR pure functions, and this is a hot topic now, as you can spot. And every, everything is hot reloadable, testable, serializable, coolable, anything able that you want to expect. And we think, okay, we want to use Redux and we want to use Backbone. Uh, how we can make them live together? Because we can finally separate our backend data from our UI data. So we thought that the architecture will look like this. Backbone view will call React and pass some callbacks that eventually any UI interaction will call it. Then action creator will call backbone model, generate action, pass it to reducer, reducer will change the store, store will change the React and it will change the DOM. What? Yeah, it's, it's not uh, understandable at all, but it also have some like other problems like what about validations, server responses that not good enough and other parts of application can also change the state of it and we need to somehow to sync. So we thought if it will be only possible so we can continue to change our backbone models and collections and the changes will be in Redux store automatically. And of course as you know uh, I will not be presenting here if this will not like develop something so you can uh, npm install it now with love from Redbooth. Uh, team and do it uh, out of the way. And small demo. So, of course, the best way to show something is to do MVC. <laughs> so, and it's really working application. Uh, and of course, it's React, as you can see, it's what, what, what enough it could be. And the cool way, as I st told you about Redux, is like PR functions, everything is reloadable, so you can run. Uh, developer tools for React, uh, for Redux, and see all the actions that I did. And you can do time traveling and any way that you want. And it just works. And this is really backbone. We still live in this old legacy world. So just to show it, oops. This is true. Just imagine that someone from another part of your application calls changing the, your collection and we have it here with a new event and we can also use it now. So future and legacy together. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. My name's Edward Andrews Hodgson. I'm Edward Andrews on Twitter. Uh, I work in the UK for Sky TV as a web developer. Sorry, 
I'm not talking loud enough, apparently. Can you hear me now? Uh, so, wow. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you very briefly about uh, coding with young people. This is something that I do quite a lot, and I'd like to try and encourage you all to do it. So, briefly, what do I do? Um, what do I do? Uh, <laughs> I work with two UK organisations. Uh, the first one's Code Club. This is where I go to a local school with uh, 9 to 11 year olds. I go every week for an hour and uh, we write some HTML. We've started writing some JavaScript. Um, it's really good fun for me. And the second one that I've been involved with is this thing called Festival of Code, which is a big week-long event, a hackathon type thing for 11 to 18 year olds, where they get together into teams for, week, for a week, they have an idea, and they see if they can develop it. So, why do I do this? So, it's to help young people appreciate the fundamental beauty of programming and understand the technology around them, and to give back to the community. Hmm. No, really. <laughs> why do I do this? Mainly because it's really good fun. Young people learn so quickly, they progress so well, you learn loads from them. If you're going to try and teach or mentor, then you really have to know what you're talking about. And quite often they'll ask you a question which seems really sensible and easy to them, but is actually really complex. And it sends you away thinking, uh, and you have to sort of maybe come back to them a week or two later with a nice, easy answer. It also reminds you that there's a whole load of resources out there for people to learn from. The internet, as we know, is a marvelous thing, and you can learn whatever you want if you know how to look. So one of the things I feel I teach more than actual programming skills is the ability to use the internet to, to learn stuff. Um, as I said, young people are really inspiring. They have so many wild ideas. Quite often, as you age, you sort of close down your mind a little bit and you reject ideas because they seem a bit silly. Young people don't have that at all. So it's really exciting and really inspiring. So if you found that interesting and you'd like to do something like that at home, what can you say to convince your boss? So there's little or no expense. It's maybe if you're sort of doing something regular, it might be an hour or two of your time a week. Uh, you could tell him it improves your interpersonal skills because you're having to talk to people who aren't total geeks like the rest of us. Um, your boss might find it's good PR. Maybe he'll get in the local newspaper on the telly or whatever. And maybe they'll find future employees or interns. But that's only if you want to uh, persuade your boss. I would say these are the most important things, really. It's fun. The young people are inspirational. And you can learn quite a lot yourself. So if what I've said sounds at all interesting, I'd just like you to try and get involved. As I said, I'm Edward Andrews, uh, Edward Andrews Hodgson, now I'm married. Uh, <laughs> my Twitter's at Edward Andrews. I've recently moved to Sky, and I'm trying to encourage Sky to get involved in more of this sort of thing. So if anything that I've said sounds sensible to you, it'd be really useful to me if you could tweet mentioning my, ha my, uh, my name, saying, oh, that sounds brilliant. We should all get involved in working with young people. Thank you very much. Cool. Hi, uh, my name's Phil Nash. Uh, you might recognize me because I did the lightning talks at the Ruby conference, but I'm doing a different one now. So hi, I am a developer evangelist for Twilio, and um, I would uh, and, and I just want to show you uh, something I think is really cool and quite new for us, uh, which is video, because this is JavaScript side of things. Um, Twilio is normally an, uh, a communications API in which we uh, allow you to make or receive uh, phone calls or send or receive text messages, but now we're doing video. Um, this is a demo, uh, and demos are terrible, so let's write some code. This is the actual demo. It's blank right now. Um, so let's jump over here and build it. Um, because I think uh, if you've dealt with any WebRTC, which is what this is based on, um, then you'll know it's a horrible thing to deal with. And uh, I want to make it nicer and show you how to do that. So I'm just going to build up a quick uh, HTML page here with a couple of divs on it. One for me and one, hello, one for you. I can't type, of course. It's really weird when there's two microphones in your eyes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we're just going to add a quick uh, JavaScript to the page. This is just Twilio.js. This is the framework that's going to make all this happen for us. And they need one more script tag in which to do stuff in. 
Um, so inside that script tag, we need to do a couple of things. Uh, we're gonna create an endpoint. Uh, an endpoint is your address within the Twilio system. Uh, and for that to work in the front end, we need an access token. Uh, and I'm gonna go get that access token right now from our, um, uh, oops, here we go. This is from the, uh, uh, our uh, testing tools for this, and that's just the application. It's a horrible long string. Normally you would generate those on the, um, uh, on the server. So we're gonna make that endpoint and give it the access token, and then uh, that endpoint can listen for events. Uh, an invitation, for example. Uh, and when you get an invitation, you can do, hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you get that invitation, you can do something with it. Um, and in this case, uh, because I'm nice, I'm just going to accept the invitation. And accept returns a promise, which gives you a uh, conversation back in the, uh, in the callback. And with that conversation, uh, we get our uh, local media, which is pretty cool. And I'm gonna attach that to that div, which is me. Uh, lovely, and that conversation will also probably uh, get some participants as well, so we can l listen to people uh, joining. Participant uh, connected. So when a participant connects, um, you also get uh, a callback with that participant, one of the hardest uh, variables to spell. Uh, and that participant will come with their media, which you can attach to uh, you, for example. And if I click on the mouse, uh, there we go. Uh, to you. And the only thing we have left to do with this is actually make that endpoint listen for those incoming connections. Uh, cool. So um, that's, uh, that's that side of things. I'm just gonna build the other side. You didn't need to see me type out all the HTML again. So that's all here with an access token ready to go. And this is the other side where that endpoint that I've created is gonna create a conversation. And I called uh, my other endpoint, Phil, earlier. So I'm just gonna Create that conversation to me. That's all I needed to do there. The rest is basically the same. Um, so that, uh, let's reload that. That page is now waiting uh, for invitations. Uh, this page is the one that's gonna make the invitation, so it should ask me to share my media. Uh, and on this side, I will get the invitation on the other side, uh, which I'll share me. And there we go. That is you and me, WebRTC uh, HTML video, peer-to-peer uh, -peer connection using Twilio video. Uh, <laughs> if you're interested, come and see me out at the Twilio table. Thank you very much. Let's see. I'm on Is it? Yeah. Okay, that works. Uh, hi, my name is Tim, uh, and I work for a company uh, called Hyper in Oslo, Norway. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, a hobby project of mine called Wozer, which is World of Warcraft in the browser. And one of the first questions that I get whenever I talk to people about this, they basically go, why in the world would you want to do that? Uh, which is a very good question. Um, and we've, we've had a couple of talks uh, outlining that it's very good to sort of, you know, do crazy stuff and be, be curious. And that's basically one of those things. Um, how do AAA games, how do they work? Would it even run in a browser? How would, you, how, how would you even go about doing such a thing? So if we take a step back uh, and look at the official PC and Mac clients, uh, at least at the time, at the expansion that we're talking about, which is Wrath of the Lich King, which is like 2007, 8, uh, it had 17 gigs of data that you had to load, or at least have on your system. Face those microphones. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, Let's see, um, and it will be irresponsible to load 18 gigs of data uh, in, in a browser. Uh, so one of the things that Wozer at least does is uh, it fires up this little pipeline server, which is in Node, uh, and it has a copy of the client accessible. Uh, so it can basically, the, the browser client can basically fetch these resources on demand. So it will, it will reach into the game archives and fetch out textures and models and stuff. Uh, and the browser can use that. And then for the network connectivity, uh, the normal client would basically just connect over TCP to a game server and connect. Uh, we can't do that in JavaScript, so one of the solutions there would be to use a proxy. Uh, so the browser client speaks uh, WebSocket, and the game server isn't the, isn't the wiser, really. It just does what it normally does. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about is reverse engineering. Um, there are a lot of really clever people on the internet that have sort of figured out how Blizzard's protocols and file formats, how they work. Uh, but sometimes you need to get sort of your hands dirty and you might have to look at a file that looks something like this. This is a 
uh, model file for a, it's, the file is called troll tent, uh, and it's for, uh, it contains like 3D points in space and textures and that kind of stuff for a tent. Uh, usually when you're looking into this kind of stuff, your face at the end of the day will look something like this. Um, I wanna, I, I would have really liked to show the entirety of this working. Uh, unfortunately, only two parts work. Uh, one is the visualization, so actually fetching, say, uh, a city or some sort, of, some sort of other model and rendering it. And the other thing that works somewhat uh, is game server interaction, so you can log in, list your characters, and see stuff happening in the console. Uh, so I'll, hope, let's see if this works. Uh, this is gonna be interesting. Where is my cursor? Here. Let's see, I'll try and make this full screen. So this is basically the client on the left-hand side, and if I now were to log in here, you'll see that it's basically sending out a bunch of packets, and it's connected to realms, which in World of Warcraft are essentially just worlds. So Blizzard scales up horizontally, and you can have multiple worlds. So if we connect to this one, you can see that I got my character here called Kazum. Uh, I only have one, so if I now click on Join World, we have this beautiful penguin here, which is a bit irrelevant, but just see away from that. Uh, you can see that there's basically a bunch of packets going back and forth. So for example, the server sent messages, the server sent, uh, let's say, learn dance moves for some reason. Uh, so you get, you get a lot of info. Uh, monster movement is around me right now, but I can't really visualize any of that. Uh, so what I'll, this is the networking bit. Uh, and then one other bit that I would like to show is, let's see if I can, I'm just gonna change the code of things a bit to, actually render up the dwarven capital of Ironforge. Let's see, where's my mouse? So if I now reboot this, and I just go directly to the game, just skip over all the other stuff. Basically, th this, this is basically doing none of the stuff that Rob this morning talked about. There's no performance optimizations. This is using web workers, but it doesn't really work very well. So if we zoom out, you can basically see that it's loading up uh, basically the, the entire uh, capital in blocks. So it is doing the chunk thing that Neil talked about. So Blizzard has sort of cut up every single uh, model in tinier pieces and they get loaded up. So we still have our penguin down here. Uh, <laughs> no animations either, I'm very sorry, Courtney. Um, basically, we could just use our penguin. He's just gonna be cruising. Uh, uh, So basically, as you can see, there's, there's plenty of stuff missing. There's no lighting, uh, there's no animations, obviously. Uh, there's no lava. Um, but I figured it'd be cool to show regardless. Is it done? Go right over to the next. Yeah. <laughs> so that was it. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Johannes, that's my name. That's my face. I don't know what I'm doing with my hands, uh, but people have been speculating. <laughs> I also work for Hyper, like Tim. Uh, with a bunch of awesome people, and I want to talk to you about uh, prank-driven development. And so prank-driven development is a uh, way to learn new things, if you're a baby, uh, and also if you want to learn new things more often than you have good ideas for things to actually make, uh, which is, for me, a lot, because I have really, I, I don't have good ideas. Anyway, so one thing I wanted to learn uh, was about Git hooks and how they work, because you can do a lot of really useful stuff uh, with Git hooks, and of course, I did not none of those things. Uh, so instead, um, I made this thing. And this is actually, you know, all the same. It's actually probably the most useful prank I have ever made uh, because we had this problem with um, one of the guys on our team, and he kept forgetting to, to push his stuff to the server when he went down for the day. And we would be, you know, we would have this merge conflicts when he came back, and it was just super annoying. So anyway, I figured, you know, we're going to make him remember, and you'll see, you know, why this sort of works. We don't have this problem anymore. Uh, so I'm gonna try a live demo and see how that works. All right. So. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. So this would be his repo. He's just you know plunking away, no trouble. And I would sneak over, and I would install this thing while he's out for lunch. <laughs> and uh, this, this might take a while on this Wi-Fi, I guess. Uh, anyway, it's, it's downloading a song. And then I could, I could like pretend nothing is happening right now and just kind of go like, yeah, standing over here, not doing anything bad at all. Uh, and you know, hopefully on our network it's, it's slightly faster. And then it's gonna apply the thing. And now I'll just you know, do this. And then when he comes back, he's like, okay, you know, just gonna do my stuff. 
such a file, and then I'm gonna make my commit. Oh, nothing bad here. And you know this, I can't even, like he can't stop this, and every second it's gonna jank the volume back up to 10. Uh, so if he tries, <laughs> it's just gonna keep playing. And, and every time he does this, it's just gonna, you know, he, he couldn't figure it out, and I, you know, wasn't being helpful. So basically, he would just plug in his headphones, and then just kind of put them down, and then keep doing his work. <laughs> and this went on for like, you know, hours, and I, I was having so much fun. Anyway, uh, now he always pushes stuff, it's great. Um, <laughs> So, so it's, it's you know, somewhat useful, I guess. Um, the next thing I wanna show you, if I can just get this thing up again, here we go. Uh, another thing I wanted to learn about, rather, is, is browser extensions, and they're pretty simple, as you know, probably all of you guys know, uh, but I didn't, uh, and so some of the guys I work with had this pretty cool idea for like a, a campaign for a, an organization we work with um, that work uh, for the safety on roads. So they figured, let's make a browser plugin that has like a speedometer on the side, so when you scroll, it's gonna tell you how fast you're going. <clears throat> and then they could put like obstacles in the way, like, you know, cute old ladies, grumpy old men, and you'd have to, you know, slow down so you don't run them over, or, you know, your website would just stop or something like that. And I thought, yeah, th that's a cool idea. And they asked me, you know, is that even possible? Can we do that? And I'm like, yeah, I, I have no idea, because I, I don't know how to make browser extensions. So you'd think, you know, now that I have this sort of cool idea, I would just, you know, make that. Uh, but of course, I, I didn't. So instead, I made this thing. And uh, I don't know if you can see this. Basically what this does, it, it's a plugin that replaces any instance of he, she, or it with the name of my friend and colleague, Gion Tadia. And that's, that's, that's the guy right there. And, and so I would, you know, obviously when he went for lunch, uh, same old story, I'd go over, install this in the machine, because I don't, I don't test my software, I make my coworkers test my software. Um, so, uh, so when he came back, this is actually pretty subtle, because, you know, you can browse a lot of things and you're not gonna see he, she, or it, you know, you're just gonna like, glance over it, but sometimes you know, you're gonna get some pretty interesting results, and so I have some samples. So he would see, you know, he starts seeing stuff like this. <laughs> or like this. And he has no idea, you know. <laughs> the hell. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so now I know how to make browser extensions, and also, Thanks to this guy, this guy. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can do this with your friends because now you can change out the name. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>